All right, here we go. Stormy Daniels, welcome to Vlad TV. Thank you. Well, you know, a lot of people know about you. A lot of people heard stories about you, but this is the first time we're actually sitting down together. So I want to do the whole story. Okay. Starting from the very beginning. Uh, so where'd you actually grow up? I grew up in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. I know you, you went to North Dakota for a while, Florida for a while. Yeah, all over the place. But that was all before the age of four. I was born in Baton Rouge and then moved back there when I was like four or five and all the way through high school. Okay. And your parents were together at one point and then your father ended up leaving mm -hmm. the family? Uh, yeah, they split up when I was four and a half, I believe. Okay. And then I guess your mom remarried at one a point? A couple times, yeah. A couple times. I didn't keep track. Okay. So what was Baton Rouge like growing up? Um, well, when you're there and you don't know any better, you you know, it, it was fine. It's small town. Um, it's, it's the capital city. So they think they're bigger and more important than they are. Uh, I live in New Orleans now. New Orleans is really the heart of I Louisiana. love New Orleans, by the way. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, shout out amazing. to Commander's Palace, my favorite restaurant right? in the whole world. Have you got to sit in the kitchen? <laughs> Not yet. This, next time you go, you have to ask for the special table oh, in the kitchen. It's I'm a, doing that. I'm it's totally so doing cool that. to watch them work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So you're growing up in, a, in Baton Rouge, mm -hmm. and you have a relatively normal childhood until the age of nine. Correct. Talk about what happens then. So... My parents had split up and my mom was a single mom and was working. And I honestly believe that it was my dad leaving that kind of cracked her because up until then she was pretty normal, like a, a good mom, I guess. And I think she literally just, it broke her heart. Um, I believe she was very much in love with my dad and he met another woman and, and left and she just kind of wasn't the same. And so she was working, obviously, um, quite a bit to pay pay bills and stuff and a second job. And uh, and then I think she just kind of started doing her own thing a lot. And she just would go away and would be gone for longer and longer periods of time. I wish I had an explanation. I wish I could say, oh, she was a drug addict or she was an alcoholic. But the truth is, I don't think she was. I, I mean, I saw my mother drink maybe five times in my whole life and it was a wine cooler at a barbecue. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't yeah. really count as being like an alcoholic and I never saw or suspected drugs. You know, she didn't have like a gambling addiction. So I think she was just, honestly, that's the one of the big mysteries of my life is where the hell are, where is she? But, you know, so she started being gone and um, I'd walk home from school. And I did grow up in a, in a pretty bad area. I think when, you know, my parents bought the house, it was okay, but it got, it got pretty dangerous pretty quick. And yeah. so I'd walk home and I had a friend and I just started spending more and more time roaming the streets. Like that sounds, that sounds worse than it is playing outside. And, uh, and I had a friend that lives around the corner and, and I was really good friends with her and, she, I'm assuming you're talking about the the neighbor situation, right. which means you probably read my book. Yeah. I'm impressed. I didn't think people read it anymore. Yeah. Um, but yeah. And so, like I said, she she and I would play together and she, there was a, you know, a predator who lived next door to her. And she just wasn't as, what is the word I'm looking for? She, and I'm not going to say her name. The name in the book is not her name. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing in my book that is changed, by the way. Um and I just, I found myself like I was a year and a half older than her and just feeling the need to protect her. Um, and so I just put myself, as I tend to do, in bad situations, trying to do the right thing or to help other people. And it was, he molested both me and her. And it wasn't until he tried it with a girl who was visiting a relative on the street who was much older than us, who was like, what the fuck is going on? And he got in trouble. But honestly, it's just another, oh my God, I didn't even put two and two together until right now. Holy fuck. Oh, can I cuss? Yeah, go ahead. Um, that it's just another fail, like failure by the justice system that when it comes to dealing with victims, because he never served time. And I don't really know why. And um, I kind of wasn't allowed to play with her anymore. And like we grew apart. But I do know he never served any time whatsoever. And fun fact, when I was much older, I went back mm. with, and I will admit, some bad intentions and discovered, unfortunately, he was already dead. Well, I guess you actually tried to approach your mother and a guidance counselor. Yeah. And you told them what happened and they didn't believe you. Um, I didn't, 
I, I approached a guidance counselor. My mom, I know she knows. This is one of the reasons I don't speak to her because before this even happened, like before the other girl reported it, before there, there was anybody involved, my mother actually said to me, something weird going on. I get a bad vibe from this person. And um, I, I think he had said something inappropriate to her. And so she asked me, and and she immediately, before I even got my answer out, followed it with, because that's the case, you need to stop playing with my friend who lived next door. And I didn't want that to happen. Like, then I'd be all alone for weeks with nobody to even hang out with. Are you fucking kidding me? So I was like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. So I totally lied. Um, I mean, I was nine and was like, no, I've never seen anything weird. Because at that point, that was my only friend and my only, and her parents fed me. Like I probably would have starved to death, to be quite honest. And so I lied about it. Um, and that's the last my mother and I talked about. It. She goes, good. Well, we don't want any more. We don't want people snooping around. So she kind of, but I never approached her again specifically about it. But when the shit hit the fan, so to speak, uh, my friend spoke to the guidance counselor at school and, and I went in and tried to as well. And for some reason they believed her and not me. Um, and I, the, one of the most heartbreaking, heartbreaking moments of my life was I was over at uh, my friend's house. I'm trying very hard not to say her name. Uh, my friend's house, I think I was staying the night or whatever. And I was in her bedroom. And you know when like you come out and you hear people talking, you can tell that their voices are, are lower, which automatically makes you do what? Listen more. Listen more, because you can tell that they're talking about somebody or something. So I came out of her room to use the restroom, and I could hear the adults in the living room talking. And I could tell by their hushed tone that it was probably something interesting, right? And so, like, I crawled down the hallway, and they were talking about me. And they were telling, talking about, like, white trash I am and, like, that I smelled bad because my mom smoked in the car in the house, and they didn't smoke. I smelled like cigarettes, basically. And that I was white trash and that I, you know, they should probably – keep me from hanging out with her and and I don't know which voice belonged to who but one of the adults was like she's a kid like then then what's who's what's gonna happen and they're like oh I just think she's a bad influence and she's trash and her mom's a, like a, a bunch of things that I don't remember clearly but that was like the first time that I understood like being an outcast or social class even we lived on the same street but like her parents were still married they had a normal family they definitely had nicer things uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And I just, they're like, oh, she's probably, you know, some, it was almost implied that somehow I was responsible when honestly it was the exact opposite. That was, that situation was already going on. Who knows how long before I was like, wait, this is not okay. Yeah. I'm sorry that happened to you. And this is, you're only nine years old. So this is how you lost your virginity pretty much. Uh, there was no intercourse. Oh, there wasn't. Not. It's like oral and stuff yeah. like that. Oh, okay. I mean, I guess, just, it's just as disgusting, Te honestly. Technicality, but, yeah. I guess. I don't know. Yeah, but still. Okay. And then you end up moving out of your house at 17? Yes. Okay. And right around that time, you started to strip? Yeah, it was around the same time. So I had a boyfriend who was older than me. Not a lot. Two years. Like, appropriately older than me. Yeah. Not like a weird situation. And... uh my mother and I were just fighting all the time. She accused, I remember like one big, huge fight we had. She accused me of being on drugs. And I was like, I'll take drug test me right now. I have straight, I go to a magnet school. I have straight A's. I have a job. I compete my horse, which I paid for myself by cleaning stalls. Um, would you pass a drug test? Cause I know I will. I was <laughs> such a bitch. Um, but I just had enough of her. She just became, like I said, she started off normal and that just progressed. She just became more and more like, out of touch, so to speak. I mean, we're talking about a woman who sold baby pictures of me to a magazine in the UK a couple years ago, and half of the pictures weren't even fucking me. So it raises wow. the question, like, are you so crazy that you don't realize you sold pictures of somebody else? Are you such a bitch that you didn't have enough of me to make money so you purpose? Like, who knows? She's she's a monster. Who knows? Um, but I think this story got cut out of my book. This is the the time. I, this is why and when I moved out of my house. Uh, I remember like it was yesterday. Uh, it was around Christmas time because the Christmas tree was up. 
And it was me, my boyfriend, my best friend, and the guy she was hanging out with. It was four of us. And we're in the living room and we're watching Conan O'Brien. Like, that's how vivid this is. And we weren't being loud. We were we were just being quiet watching TV. And my mom was in her room sleeping or whatever. And there was a window with a Christmas tree and a rock, uh, like a recliner next to it. And my mom screamed so loud in her bedroom, like like she was being attacked or something. To this day, I have no idea what it was about. She comes running down the hallway in this green silk nightgown, jumps up into the the recliner and rips off her nightgown. No underwear. Hmm. And loses her balance and falls into the Christmas tree. And I was like, that's it. I'm out. And uh, <laughs> that was he, the final straw. That was it. My, my mom. And to this day, anytime I see any of those other three people, they're like, do you remember your mom ripped off her clothes and fell naked into the Christmas tree? And I'm like, Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> how could I forget? So, yeah, so it was sometime around Christmas time um, and I moved out. So it was about three months before I turned um, 18 because my, my birthday's in March. And I moved out and I didn't want to drop out of school. I really wanted to be a veterinarian. Uh, I didn't want to sell my horse. Uh, and I happened to get lucky and meet a girl who was a stripper and she made enough money on Fridays and Saturdays to cover bills until. I could leave town, I guess. And just obviously one thing led to another and I never went to college. Instead, I came here. Right. So you started stripping mm-hmm. at 17, mm-hmm. technically. I mean, I guess a few weeks before. Yeah. And then uh, you started doing like feature dancing, I guess. Yeah. So once I was legal where, <laughs> to dance, I s- changed clubs and went to work at the Nice Club in Baton Rouge, which was the Gold Club. Now it's called Penthouse. But I knew they would make me get a license and check my ID and all that stuff. So once I was 18, I went and worked there and that was a big fancy club. You know, there's like titty bars, strip clubs, and then gentlemen's clubs. I'm sure you know the difference. And so this was, this was a gentlemen's club. This was high end and they had guest stars every work week that would come in and, and do these burlesque shows. And I was like, that's what I want to do. One, cause I knew they were guaranteed money and it didn't rely on them having to like hustle or sell drinks and do lap dances and whatnot. Um, and they did get to do these. They had to wear beautiful costumes and put on these great shows. And that's what I wanted to do. So I became friends with them. I started posing for magazines. I did a couple of contests, like, you know, burlesque contests, which is how you get titles, which the the agents then used to book, like, welcome 2000 and whatever, Miss Nude North America, or feature entertainer of the year, you know. Um, And so I did all of those and I traveled and feature danced for about two and a half years, but I topped out on rate. You can only make so much unless you actually are a porn star. um, And I had a friend who was also a feature dancer that was older than me and was coming to LA to do a, a movie and she didn't want to come by herself. And she's like, I'll pay for you to come with me if you want. And I really didn't have any intention of doing porn I just wanted to come to California and she's sure enough, the first day she was here, she was working for Wicked Pictures and I got to set and their director, Brad Armstrong, saw me and was like, you do movies? And I was like, oh, no, not me. And he's like, he wanted to put me in the movie as an extra. And so I had my makeup done for the first time and the photographers were like, you need to take her in to meet the owner. And uh, and the next day or a couple days later, I actually did end up doing a girl girl scene with my friend for a different company. And long story short, five or six days later, she flew home and I never left. And I am still with Wicked Pictures. <laughs> okay. So now you're in the porn industry. Yes. And now you're shooting. Yes. And you're shooting all the time, pretty much, right? Um, or, or, or not so much? Not so much because I was under contract. Oh, okay. So you're shooting every so often. Yeah. yeah. Once a month. I did a movie a month on average. Got it. Okay, and what did you think of the porn industry once you really got into it with both feet? Um, it was nothing like I thought it was. I mean, you think it looks like, you know, I don't know what I thought. Like, I guess the best way to describe it was like, you know, people think it the impressions like boogie nights. You know, and I've now I'm not saying this is across the board. My only 95% of my adult movie experience has been on a wicked picture set because I've been on a contract for so long. Um, but I never saw abuse or drugs or partying you know and it was way more professional than i thought i make the joke all the time so much more paperwork than than you would think um but it was professional with shoot schedules and 
testing and respect and you know it was great and that was before the tube site so we had pretty big budget features we used to have good catering yeah yeah i remember yeah, porn early on was like you actually had porn stars mm-hmm. back then yeah it was a big deal on contracts and everything else right. like that i mean how was it just the process of like hey i'm gonna show up i'm gonna have sex with a guy that i've never met before and see cameras that's around where i got and- lucky that never happened to me because the first boy, remember I told you I met the guy, the director, Brad Armstrong, that very first day, and he made me an extra. And he basically didn't let me go. I stayed at his house, and we dated for a year and a half. So my first boy-girl scene was not only for Wicket, and the director was Brad. My sex scene was with Brad, and I was already sleeping with him off camera. I am fully aware of how cush I had it. Like, I didn't have to do gonzo or work with people I didn't know, and then... I was only with Wicked for about a year before I started directing all my own movies, which means I got to pick everybody I worked with. I I have never had one incident where I showed up on set and worked with someone that I didn't know, or I always got to pick the talent. It's, I am extremely fortunate in that regard. So here you are in the industry. You won uh, best new starlet Mm -hmm. uh, a year in, I guess. Yeah. And you're doing scenes and you're building up and people know your name and you know, being a contract girl, you're on the covers and you yeah. have a name that, you know, people are familiar with and so forth. And then 2006 rolls around. Yep. The American Century Championship uh, golf tournament in Lake Tahoe. If you say so. I don't I don't remember the name of it. What are you doing out there, number one? Uh, so it was a celebrity charity golf tournament event. And somehow, which I don't know how it came to be, uh, the company I work for, Wicked Pictures, sponsored a hole. And trust me, I... <laughs> Sponsored a hole. I, love it. I appreciate the irony and the humor and the fact that a porn company sponsored a hole. <laughs> like it is that that is not lost on me at all. Um, which meant that you know the golfers come around, we give them water, we take photos, and and obviously um, we had a table and a gift room as well. And it was myself and the owner of the company and the contract girls. And I remember, like, we met a lot of celebrities. Uh, Kevin Nealon was my favorite. And obviously, we all know Donald Trump came through. And the owner of the company introduced, you know, each of the girls. This is my contract girl, such and such. This is my contract girl, Jessica Drake. This is my contract girl and director, Stormy Daniels. And he was like, oh, you direct. Meanwhile, the other girl is throwing herself at him shamelessly. It was pretty disgusting and embarrassing, to be honest. And he wanted nothing to do with her. Um, and I wanted nothing to do with him. Here's your water. Here's your whatever. I kind of didn't even want to be there because I'm not. <laughs> I'm not a fan of golf. Uh, and then the next, you know, that was the, the end of that. And the next day, we and honestly, I, you know, I can't remember all the people that came through or what else we did. Um, but there was a gift room, and same thing. The celebrities came through and got gift bags from the sponsors and all that stuff. And uh, Donald Trump came through and got pictures with the girls and. Uh, talk to me again definitely you could tell he favored me but I didn't care you know what I mean um that one of our other girls was actually arguing on the phone with a guy she was dating so I was more interested in her Jessica Drake's throwing herself at him again um and then as he walked away his bodyguard circled back and said you know can I get your number Mr. Trump wants to have dinner with you and I was like absolutely not (laughs) <laughs> and so he gave me his number and said, if I change my mind to give him a call. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> no, <laughs> we were supposed to that night. Uh, uh, there was like, you know, it was a, there was stuff every night, events, appearances, whatever. And we were supposed to go to dinner with the owner of the company. And I remember bumping into two other girls in the industry that were there. They just happened to be in Tahoe. They weren't part of the golf thing. It was like, what are you like? Stormy? Alana? What are you doing here? Oh, blah, blah, blah. And um, they were, it was a girl named Alana Evans and another girl named Cindy um, that I just knew her by face. And I ended up walking to a tattoo shop with them, strangely enough, because one of the girls was getting a tattoo. And I'm telling them about what was going on and I, I ended up calling being on the phone with my publicist and I was like can you believe that this just happened and he asked me to go to dinner and he was like you should go I was like why would I do that you know and he's like because it would be a great story like you got to have you know, 
would be interesting. And it gets you out of going to the dinner that you don't want to go to. I was like, hmm, good point. And so I text him and went went to his hotel because he was staying in a different hotel and asked me to come up to meet him at the room. And we were going to make or he was going to make reservations. I wasn't. And we were going to go down and, and have dinner. And that's all I was told. And then, as everybody knows, I got there. You've read the book. He wasn't ready yet. I don't know if I was early or if he was late. I can't remember. And I got there and he famously greeted me in his silk pajamas, which I mocked him mercilessly um, and told him to go change, which he did. His bodyguard, Keith, was at the door. He never left the door. Um, and he, we ended up talking for like three hours. And at no point in this conversation was I solicited for sex, offered money for sex. He didn't even flirt with me. Like it was, uh, you know, a pretty, I even, it pains me to this day to even admit this, but it was a pretty decent conversation. To be honest, he asked business questions like, is there unions and do you get royalty? And everybody always wants to ask the questions about STDs and how I explained that Wicked Pictures was condom mandatory. And even when I work with my real life partner and he was telling me about the story about how he had a golf course somewhere overseas, I want to say Ireland or the UK or something like that, that he was fighting with environmentalists. Scotland. Scotland. He was fighting with environmentalists about some plant that birds and like, he's like, it's red tape everywhere. And so it was a really good conversation to be honest. Um, he didn't seem creepy. Um, I was not drinking. I didn't even drink alcohol back then. That was before <laughs> I started drinking. <laughs> um, and about halfway through, he was like, you're actually really smart. I was like, oh, you got to love those backhanded fucking compliments. You know what I mean? You're smart for a girl. <laughs> no. Um, and that's when he famously said, do you remind me of my daughter, which has been twisted grotesquely by the press. But I'm telling you, it it wasn't like that. You know what I mean? It was just like, because I, I was like, what do you mean? And he's like, well, she's beautiful and, and a savvy businesswoman and people underestimate her and you remind me of her. It wasn't like, you remind me of my daughter, I want to fuck you. Like, it was not like that. Mm -hmm. um, which would have, obviously, that makes a better story because that's how the press has twisted it all these years. But no, I actually thought it was a genuine compliment at the time. I really do. Um, and then he was said, I have an idea. And he gets up. And he starts pacing and he was, uh, I don't know. Do they still do celebrity apprentice? I don't know. But obviously celebrity apprentice was a big thing at the time. And he's like, I think you should just my, have you heard of my show? Have you seen my show? I was like, I haven't seen it, but I obviously know what it is. Who, who doesn't know what it is. And he's like, you should come on that. And I argue with him. I was like, there's no way that NBC is going to let a porn star on TV. Like, that's not a thing. Like, uh, I get asked to do these mainstream movies or these projects and it doesn't matter how gung ho or the producer or the director or even the investors are sometimes or how perfect I am for the role or the part or, or whatever it may be. Higher ups always have an issue. No one, no one has balls big enough to put me on TV. And that's when I saw him go challenge my balls. You know, he's like, I get a wild card every season where I get to pick someone of my choice and it can't be vetoed. If I fight for this, would you be willing to, to be that wild card? And I was like, I don't know if I want to do that. And he's like, no, 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 you don't understand. He's like, it would be so scandalous. He's like, I get, he was all about like PR stunts at the time. It was around the time he was going to shave his head, which he was never going to do. We know that. Mm. Um, when he was doing the thing with Vince McMahon and that's, you know, kind of was his whole shtick back then was just to do these outrageous cameos and things for, for PR, PR stunts. And he looked at it as a PR stunt, which, and then he would get to say like, Oh, I, I broke down the barriers I got her on. And, and for me, he's like, you, this could be your opportunity to show people that you're not just blonde hair and big tits and that porn stars aren't stupid and that you don't do this because you're too dumb to do anything else. And if you really want to be a director, cause we had talked about me being a director and that I really wanted to direct music videos and, horror movies and things like that. And I had already started directing features for Wicket. Um, and he was like, oh, this is, this can kind of, if I put you on TV and I kind of break the ice, maybe someone can step up. And I was like, but I'll just, and I was like, okay, let's assume that, that somehow you have this magical wild card and you get me on. I'm going to get voted off first. 
because it's just going to happen. And then that's doesn't really help me. You know what I mean? And he was like, no. And he openly discussed throwing Celebrity Apprentice for me by telling me what he's like, I can't guarantee you'll win. And I was like, that's almost just as shady. I'm not trying to do that. He goes, no, no, but we can brief you and get you ready and you can you'll know what the challenges are so you can be prepared and really he's like you're going to come off great cheating basically basically yes yeah. cheating and i still thought he was full of shit that there was just no it, no way to get it done and, but we i i stand by the fact and trust me it pains my fucking soul to say anything remotely nice about this person uh, but i think he was being honest i mean i i really do i think that i think he thought he had a great idea I think he saw an opportunity for a PR stunt. I think he was genuinely impressed and fond of me. And I think that the second I also challenged him that he couldn't do it, then his ego got involved. And we all know what happens when his ego gets involved. So I do believe that it was a genuine conversation. I really do. And at what point does the sex part come in? So I, like I said, I was there for like three hours. And I say this in all my interviews because I'm still very bitter about it. I never got my fucking dinner. <laughs> he's I never we never had dinner I'm very food motivated I am owed a dinner um and we were not drinking anything but water I don't even think he drinks honestly um I think that was actually something we discussed um and eventually I had to pee you know so I asked if I could use the restroom and like I said I get a lot of shit for for going to his hotel room. The, the general public cannot imagine that a woman or especially one in the adult business would go to a man's hotel room and not be expected to have sex. But it wasn't, people have this, I think like this vision of it being like a, a hotel room with like a, it, you walk in and there's the bed. You know what I mean? It, it wasn't like that. It was a huge, it was like bigger than my first three apartments. You know what I mean? It was, it had a conference table. It had a, you know, it was, and I've had many, many business meetings in hotel rooms like that. Um, there were strictly business meetings. Um, you know, it had a living room and a kitchen and, and it was, that's not weird, especially if you're recognizable. You don't have the luxury always of having a private conversation or a business meeting in a restaurant because people are going to come up and interrupt you the whole time, which I would imagine is how his life is, as, you know? And so it didn't strike me as weird. Um, my guard was up when I opened when he came to the door, obviously, and he was in the pajamas and I immediately, f you know, destroyed him verbally. But th then he was perfectly fine. We had, like I said, we had a good rapport. We had a business conversation. I believe that, you know, he was genuinely interested in what I had to say. And we obviously he hatched a plan to get me on a television show uh, with his own motives, of course, which is fine. Um, and so I was completely caught off guard i told him about my family i told him where i grew up i told him that i wanted to be a director i explained all of those things to him and eventually i needed to use the ladies room and so he was like it's through the bedroom over there help yourself so that's what i did i went to the the restroom and i spent quite a bit of time in there because i'm not gonna lie i snooped <laughs> you know what i mean um which is one of the things that proves i was there i can tell you everything it's never been denied um so I, was, I i peed i touched up my lip gloss you know dug through his toiletry bag <laughs> i have i have no shame i did i mean who wouldn't right uh, i didn't steal anything though um and then when i came out he had come into the room because when i left he was in the dining room when i came out he was perched on the bed doing his best most tragic burt reynolds <laughs> And I was just like, I don't know what happened to me, but I felt like my heart fell out of my vagina. <laughs> like it just, it, you know, people say like their heart drops to their stomach. Mine went past that. Like it just, I remember like feeling hot water in my ears. You know what I'm talking about? Like this is horrible feeling and thinking to myself, Ugh. how did I like how did I misread this situation or like ugh, here we go like another guy that's doesn't think or that thinks that because I work in porn or I'm a stripper that I, I don't know I kind of and then I 
it was like your soul leaves your body and I yanked it back in for a moment and tried to make a snarky, funny comment because that's what I do. I think I'm hilarious. And when up until two years ago, yes, up until two years ago, the next thing that I remember was sidestepping and him jumping up. Now, he never threatened me. He never put his hands on me. Um, I do remember glancing and remembering that his bodyguard was standing right outside the door. Like, what am I going to do? Um, and then I blacked out. And I think that when I first told the story, people misconstrued that when I say blacked out, that I passed, like that I had been drinking. So I'm so adamant. There was no drugs. There was no alcohol. There was none of that. Um, and I just woke up on the bed naked with him fucking me, which there's an extreme loss of time there of about um, at least two minutes, perhaps as little as 60 seconds, because I distinctly remember what I was wearing. And I'm telling you the shoes I had on were these gold sandals with like a bunch of little buckles, like high heels. They were off. They're not easy to get on and off. So I have, I don't remember taking them off or how they got off or if I did it, if he did it, I literally kind of had like an out of body experience or something like that. And then, so I, it was, I, and it was weird because we were on this side, like the bathroom door and the bed. So you would think that we would be here, but somehow my clothes and stuff were on this side of the bed and we were on this side, you know what I mean? And cause we were by the window and I don't know how I got there. I legit don't know how I got there. The next thing I know is he was having sex with me and I never said no. Um, but I didn't say yes either. And I, and then up until two years ago and, this is not something that I have talked about a lot because obviously most of the book and the interviews and stuff was longer than two years ago. I went to see, um, me and my ex went to see that movie, um, bombshell. Okay. And there's, you know, and I, I didn't think I would, I hate to use the word triggered, but, um, it was in that movie that uh, all the rest of it came back. And I remember standing there and when I went to sidestep him jumping up, which I've always remembered, but this is something I never understood why the press, the editor, there's a gap in the book. Like everything is so detailed. I can tell you where, what pocket on his toiletry bag, his gold plated tweezers were in and what brand shampoo he uses and, and what exactly I was wearing, but the, I don't know how my dress and shoes got off. Like no one thought to like push me harder for that. Like I, how did that slip through? And like no one, I've been interviewed by time and Rolling Stone and nobody was like, wait, so you just, you know what I mean? But now I do remember that I was standing there and I went to sidestep and he got up and I was like, what are you doing? And he basically used my you don't want to go back to Louisiana. Like if you really want to be a director and be taken serious, people who work for me, they got to really go all out. You got to show me you'll do whatever it takes. Cause there's a lot of people fighting for the same thing and people are hungry. And I just, I didn't, that's what I wanted. And it wasn't until I watched that movie at the end where the main characters are talking about how, um, if she had spoke up, She's by not speaking up, she's responsible for everybody who came after her. And in my case, it just I remember sitting in the movie theater and just my poor date was like, what the fuck is with this crazy bitch? Because I was fine. And then I just lost it. Like, I just lost it. I started like blowing snot bubbles in the movie theater because it's it's true. If I had said something. Maybe the people who got. Violated, assaulted, whatever word put in an uncomfortable position, whatever word you want to use um, after me. I'm not saying that they all wouldn't have happened, but at least they maybe would have been informed. And what breaks my heart is I now know that <clears throat> one of the girls that came after me was a 13 year old girl. Wait, 13 year old girl was that's the one that I don't know her name, but uh, that claimed that something happened between her and Trump and they threatened her and she dropped it. Came after you, meaning what? A, a certain amount of time later, that yeah, same yeah. day. No, 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 okay, no, no, not a certain amount of time. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Years later, years later. Well, you know, I mean, to play devil's advocate, most porn girls 
escort. Of not, not everyone. I'm not saying, you know, you, you're in that bunch. No. But when you look at porn as a whole, of most girls, whether they call it a sugar daddy or whether and I'm they're fine actually, with that. I'm you know, totally fine with it. put ads out or whatever, most, most porn girls escort. Of course. So I don't think it's an unreasonable assumption that, hey, this, this working porn star mm -hmm. comes over to my you know, hotel room. I'm going to pay her. We're going to have sex and we're going to go our separate ways. Well, he never paid me either. So he never paid you? <laughs> no. Okay. He never offered to pay no, you? No, like absolutely that? not. Seems like it would have been easier if he just did that as of opposed course. to try to sell you a dream and, uh, and the whole thing. 100%. Not. <laughs> 100%. And then I would have been able to say yes or no. Right. Um, I will be completely honest with you. At that point, it's, I was so naive. This is, It never came up and I expected it to. I really did. I was like, he's going to offer me money. And part of me was like, I wonder how much he thinks I'm worth. Like, <laughs> that's just me being brutally honest. I was I mean, Were you escorting at all at no, that time? Okay. absolutely not. Got it. Absolutely not. And if he would have offered, I would have said, no, thank you. Um, but I have no problem with it. All my friends are escorts. I, you know, right. like I. That's I've, what I'm saying. Yes, absolutely no problem. But not only was it not discussed, it was, you know what I mean? Or implied in any way. Like there wasn't even footsie under the table. He didn't seem remotely attracted to me um, at all, honestly, yeah, once we got to talking. And um, and then if that was, and if that had been the case, he didn't be like, how much do I owe you? Or thank you for your time. There was no transaction, which is one of the things that really upsets me is because if that had been the case, uh, this would not be a problem. You don't, you don't sell out a client. I, I read tarot cards now. I, I have clients that I, I do work with. It's the same. Like you don't discuss that, you know, um, it's a business transaction. You were, you've agreed to do something and this wouldn't be a thing. Yeah. Well, in your book, you go into graphic detail about uh, his physical attributes. Or lack of. Uh, you de described his penis as smaller than average, but not freakishly small. Right. But you also said that he has a very unusual penis, mm -hmm. like a huge mushroom head, yes. like a toadstool. And you said in the book, <laughs> I lay there annoyed that I was getting fucked by a guy with Yeti pubes and a dick like the mushroom character in Mario Kart. Yeah, I ruined Mario. Uh, do you know what I mean? hey, how much hate mail I got from Super Mario fans? <laughs> I bet. So much. I single-handedly ruined Mushroom Farmers and Mario Kart fans <laughs> in one sentence. They were so angry. And I'll tell you that, like, that's one of the things that, that people sometimes give me shit about is, why did you body shame him? Why did you do that? And I would, that's not something I would normally do. You know what I mean? I only did it because he called me a liar. Hey, Mr. Trump, all you have to do to prove I'm lying right now, drop your pants. Prove that I'm lying. Prove I didn't see your dick. He hasn't done it, has he? I don't think he will either. <laughs> I mean, to be fair. Okay, you said uh, it may have been the least impressive sex I've ever had, but clearly he didn't share that opinion. Right. So he he got off, basically. Yes. Okay. Condoms? No. And, and he, you know, as someone who's doing porn and understands fully the implication of STDs. I, I told you, I blacked out and like he that. was already in and, there. And plus, you're talking about you were using condoms when you're actually yeah. shooting. So you, of all people, are Trust way me. more educated yep. than anyone else when it comes to mm -hmm. the dangers of that. Exactly. And you still, you know, I guess you didn't know. And then. Yeah, it was already almost over by the time I kind of was like, oh, my God, this is really. Ha oh, God, you got to be fucking kidding me. You know, I didn't even have a condom on me. That's the other thing is if I was an escort or I was going up to expect that, I remember what purse I had. It was a little gold bag that matched my heels that had a chain and it did not have a condom in it. Like you don't go, I don't even go to dinner or like out without a condom on me now, just in case, <laughs> you know, but it was, that's not what I was there for. Yeah. Okay. And then did you- Especially because I am allergic to latex. So I- always bring my own condoms because if I were to meet somebody and we were to hit it off and we want to go, chances are he wouldn't even have the right condom for me. So I always brought my own and I didn't have any with me. Like I didn't, it was not even in my realm of possibilities. And I fully admit that that was me being fucking naive and stupid. I admit it. Well, did you meet up with him again? Yes. Okay. And was this a time where you got a phone call from Hillary Clinton? Um, 
It was not the very next time. The, I think so that how, how many times did you guys meet up total? Four. Four times. Four. Over the course of how long? Ten-ish months. Okay, Less all, than a year. All, all Less than a year. Okay, within the same year. Yes, yeah. Okay. All, all, yeah. Okay, and I guess what, between those meetings, he's still stringing you along about the whole apprentice thing? Yes. So um, I was traumatized, obviously. I mean, not as much as Mario fans, but you get the idea. Um, but first of all, I didn't remember part of it. And I didn't even realize that I didn't remember it, you know? Um, but I didn't say no. I didn't realize that I had been, and I don't even, I don't want to, I still don't feel like a victim. That's just giving the person power. Like, I just didn't really feel like it was whatever. I just was like, I did this and it's not going to be for nothing. I'm going to follow through. He kept dangling. I never called him. He always called me. I was like, I'm just going to make sure that I'm never alone. And I, and I wasn't, I was never alone with him again. Not once, you know, I always had somebody with me or right outside the door. And then one time I went to the Beverly Hills hotel, my publicist who at this point we had had started dating. I, w I was not dating anybody when I went to Tahoe, um, was right outside the door. And I also like told him I was on my, I made a big show about pretending to be a, on my period and having cramps, which I didn't. But um, anyway, I was just, I took precautions, but I was not going to let that opportunity go, you know, because then it would have really been for nothing. Um, but yeah, that we did, he did call frequently, which is why it's so frustrating for me when people are like, say, oh, I just came out. I just made this whole thing up. There was a solid, almost a year where he called at least twice a week. And he had this uncanny knack of calling me whenever I was in the makeup chair on set. And I can tell you right now, at least a hundred people overheard those phone calls because I put him on speakerphone and he would talk about how he enjoyed our time together and like the sex was so good. And he called me honey bunch and, and all, and I would have him on speakerphone. Um, he might've even heard some, you were there, right? He was there for some of those phone calls. This is, you know, he's been with Wicked for longer than I have and the makeup artist and other talent. Do he call one time when I was on a mainstream set? Seth Rogen went on the Ellen show and was like, yeah, she's telling the truth. I didn't just randomly make this up when he decided to run for president. Like this was an ongoing thing. And then finally, you know, I went, I was in his office in New York with my assistant. She was standing there with me. There's so many people who can validate this entire fucking story. I'm not a liar. Like, and I've also fucked a lot of hot celebrities. If I was going to sell a story, it would, it would have been one that made me look way better. And no, I'm not going to give you any names. But, um, and then finally he had to call me and admit that the secretary, and I think her name, I forgot the name, but um, someone's wife at NBC had a problem and vetoed his unvetoable, is that a word? It is now, um, wild card. And, by then I was very serious with the person I was dating. We had gotten engaged and I just stopped answering his phone calls. It was not amusing anymore and had no purpose. And I was very much in love. Um, and then after a few weeks, he just gave up. So did you guys only have sex that one time? Yes. Okay. So all the other meetings, you guys, no. it was platonic. Okay. And the phone call with Hillary. Mm -hmm. So they were talking on the phone. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I guess they were actually working together at that point. That's the impression. That's when I she got. was running against Obama. Yes, got it. That's the impression I got. Right. Which so people always say, and I don't understand why this is not what got picked up on. It's just one is so frustrating and also proves how fucking stupid society is and what Puritans we are. That like the important part of this story or the, the part that people put so much emphasis on was the sex. Honestly, who cares where two people fuck? Who cares where he puts his penis? That should be between the people doing the deed and their partners or whatever. And, and, and he was married to Melania. Yeah, but we don't know what their deal was. Yeah, there you go. Maybe she was into it. Yeah, who knows? We don't know. Right. Fair enough. And, and, and honestly, who cares? You know, that, although awful and a bit inappropriate was not a crime but that's what people want to focus on is what his penis looked like and what i was wearing and what position we had sex in and did he use a condom that's all anybody ever wanted to talk about did you ever stop to think like why me 
Why was I the one that was singled out and offered money and an NDA? Out of all the girls, you cannot tell me that I was the, that well, he must have had a bunch of girls, right? Yeah, that's what I'm assuming, yeah. So what makes me so special? I'm telling you, it's the stuff that I knew. The stuff that the press glossed over. The Celebrity Apprentice, doesn't that open him up to everyone who's ever been on that show being like, hey... Um, the phone call, the the racial slurs I heard him say. The, racial slurs, which ones? The N word. About what? Uh, the, About who? Uh, and Mexicans, actually, I for, you know that they don't work and like. But all anybody want to talk about? Mexicans don't work. Shit. They're lazy. <laughs> really. I'm not, I don't know I anyone more it. hardworking than Mexicans. But he was he was talking about like welfare problem, like bills and things like that. Um, but those are the things that I heard him say. Well, who's using the N word? Uh, over. Obama. <laughs> he called Obama the N-word. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. And so like that got cut out of my book. And or and like nobody don't you like why me? Why was I so scary that they had to find me and threaten me and do this stuff? Uh, okay. So so I, I just don't it, it's now I'm gonna get shot at again. Here we go. So this happened and eventually you never got on The Apprentice, so you know you guys stopped having contact. Mm -hmm. I guess uh, when you started showing up on TV, you would look at the TV and said, "I had sex with that." Blech. Yeah, wouldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, the most straight way possible. Uh, okay, so then you go on with your life. This is essentially a chapter in your past. Yeah, you have a daughter. Yes, and then shortly afterwards. That story leaks. Yeah, that story leaks. And I can't say for certain who it was or how it happened, but like I've already told you, it was not a secret. Like I, it was very, very, very common knowledge. Um, So I can't guarantee who did it. I have a very strong idea who it was. And they saw an opportunity to make some money by selling the story. Uh, I just remember not even being on my radar. My I was recovering from a C-section. I had a newborn um, sitting on my couch and getting a call from a reporter or somebody that wanted a quote from me about the story and just feeling like, oh, my God, are you kidding me? Like my daughter's father didn't know because it honestly never occurred to me to tell him this happened three years before I met this person. Um, and he's a bit high strung. He's still a bit high strung. Um, and I just didn't want him to come out. So I tried to say like, no comments. I'm not dealing with this. And then I got, it hit a couple of websites or whatever. And they kept pushing me. And one uh, reporter from in touch made the point. We're going to run the story with or without you. This is your chance to at least make sure that it's accurate and to get something for it. Otherwise this person who kind of did you dirty is going to get the credit and the money. And I was like, Okay, fine. And they sent me, that's when they sent me for the lie detector test. And I was shitting my pants about the story coming out and there being press everywhere because I did not look, I mean, nobody, I don't know if you're married or have kids, but no woman wants to be photographed still leaking from having a baby. And like, I couldn't even stand up straight yet. You know, I was, had sur this major surgery and I didn't want to, you know, I just want to enjoy my baby. And um, it got real, then they, it got real quiet. Like the story didn't run. Um, they, st I messaged a few times and asked like, Hey, is it this week? Is it, you know, is it coming this week? I just didn't want to be in the grocery store line and there's my face. I just wanted a heads up. Is this, is this it? Is it coming? Can you, you know, and just, then they stopped responding completely. And I was like, I guess I dodged a bullet. Kind of wanted the money that they offered me. But I guess I dodged the bullet. How much are they offering? Ten grand. Okay, and I guess and the story got killed after that. It, yeah, I I don't even know what happens honestly. Um, I just know that a couple weeks later, I that's when I got cornered in the parking lot. Okay, so someone approached you mm -hmm. and said, uh, "You have a beautiful daughter. Yeah, you don't want anything to happen. Yep. you know, to her mother. Yeah, exactly. Stop so I was." About Trump. And same thing, all the women that were in that, it was like a mommy and me, it was a workout group for, you know, get back in shape after you have a baby kind of thing. And it was in this like medical park, like parking lot. And I saw the guy, he looked 
definitely not threatening. Um, I actually thought he was kind of good looking. And so I, when he walked up, I thought he was going to ask like, Hey, do you know where such and such is? Or I figured he was one of the ladies husbands or something. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Definitely nothing sketchy about this guy. Um, and that's when he said that. And I was so shaken that I went up, I went up to the workout room and went straight to the bathroom. I told them that my daughter had a, you know, messy diaper that went everywhere, but really I was just freaking out and nothing happened after that. And it was all quiet. Right. But, and to be fair, there's really no proof that Trump sent someone to do no. that. It could have been, you know, I, I mean, look at Trump he, fans in general. They're, they're lunatics. Like, you know, the Capitol, it, you know, yeah. building attack. You, you I don't, I've never said I thought it was him. Okay. I don't think it was. Yeah. I don't think so either. I don't think so. Yeah. I think it was somebody, I have no proof. I'm completely talking out of my ass at this point. I think it was somebody affiliated with the, the um, magazine and saw it and was just a fan or something. Mm. Honestly, because I don't think it was him. The story didn't come out, so it couldn't have been just a random fan. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It had to be somebody who knew about the story. Um, Michael Cohen has gotten blamed for that quite a bit, but it was before he worked for Trump. Okay. So then in 2015, Trump announced that he's running for president. The 15? Yeah. Right around that time. Oh, something. And is that when you get approached? I mean, that's when everybody I know approaches me. Right. Oh, my God. Well, I meant, did you get, uh, at that point, were you approached by, you know, his camp to actually sign an NDA and get a payment? I don't want to say the wrong thing because I honestly can't remember if it was 2015 or 16. Okay, well, right around that yeah. time. Because they'll come after me on a technicality that I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. Okay, and Cohen yeah. approaches you? No, no, um, it was not Michael Cohen. Uh, I got a bunch of people trying to push me to sell the story. Oh, he's going to run. No, 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 no. Because I had managed not to, my daughter's father didn't know. He never found out about, you know, what happened when it almost ran. I wasn't going to tell them until they gave me a date. They never gave me a date, so I never told them. Um which is the reason why I didn't call the police or tell them what happened in the parking lot. Like I just wanted it to go away. And it did for a long time, um, which is why I was saying no this time around. Same thing though. It gets dug up. It gets leaked. People are talking about it. And I remember being on set, um, directing a movie for Wicket. And I got a call from a PR person, uh, and some her attorney friend, I don't know what their relationship is, Keith Davidson had gotten, this is what I was told, had gotten a call from Trump's camp. And they wanted me to sign an NDA. Um, I don't, I'm not privy to those conversations. I don't know if it was Cohen that called him or he called Cohen or there was another person involved. I do not know. Maybe one day I'll know. All I know is that I was directing and I got this phone call and I said, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, this cannot happen. And basically she was like, can, I'm coming to set. I need to talk to you in person. We can't be on the phone. We can't have text. Like this needs to, I was, so I like, I'm freaking out. I'm telling my crew, you know, who is still my crew. I, they're working for me on Monday. It's the same group of people. Like all these people can validate everything I have said. And um, they came to set. It was the, there was the first, the one and only time or the, the first I had met Keith Davidson, the attorney. He had the contract in the back and the the trunk of his car. I literally signed it. I didn't even question. They're like, here's the amount. Sign it this way. Um, it'll never come out. And it was $130,000. Yes. Which I didn't get that amount. I got a weird number, like 80 some, whatever, minus. He got a big percentage. Who got a percentage? Was Keith a Davidson, yeah. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. So you got... It was a hundred thirty thousand dollar payment. You got to keep eighty something thousand. Mm-hmm. You signed an NDA. Mm-hmm. Trump did not sign the NDA though. No. Did two people have to sign or no? I when I signed it, his signature was on it. Yeah, okay. I signed it first. Okay, you signed it first, and he was supposed to sign it. Yeah. Okay, which he never signed, by the way. Mm-hmm. Which makes it not valid. Right, and we'll get to that. Uh, so you sign this NDA, you get this check. Mm-hmm. It wasn't a check; it was a wire. It was a wire. And at that point, did you feel like it was over? Yes. Okay. Um, 
But this whole thing with the payment is a very touchy subject, and we'll kind of get get to that as the as the story progresses. So it, you get this payment, you think it's over, and the payment itself is very sketchy because we don't know whether it you know came from campaign funds or Trump personally yeah. or someone else or, or a friend or, or whoever. But then, right before the election on uh, January twelfth, two thousand eighteen, the Wall Street Journal ran a story about this, mm-hmm. which includes the one hundred thirty thousand. It includes Michael Cohen. It includes the NDA. It pretty much is the whole thing. Yep. You know, and this is not in Touch Weekly. This no. is the Wall Street Journal, which is considered a completely legitimate right. publication that that checks its sources, true journalism, right. everything. So when it comes out. On that platform, you can't say this is whatever. Yeah. When that came out, what did you think? Uh, I shit my pants all over again. <laughs> I was in a hotel room in New Jersey working by myself and my phone, I was sleeping. I was taking a nap and I woke up to like 300 text messages and missed calls. I thought someone had died. Um, and obviously everybody knew sent the link. Everybody's trying to reach me. Um, and I was like, this is absolutely not happening. I'm not saying anything. And then from there, they messaged, they contacted me again, which the NDA specifically said that we couldn't talk about it, but we also couldn't contact each other. Not only could me and Trump not talk to each other, but like we couldn't have representatives or family. There was nothing. Perfect, right? Um, And they wanted me to sign this statement. Uh, And I was fine with signing the NDA and taking the payment to say nothing. There's a big difference between saying nothing and lying. What was the statement? um, It's the one that ran everywhere. It just said, I did not have enough. And I was like, I'm not comfortable signing this. I don't want to sign this. I'm not a liar. Oh, are you trying to get more money? No, I'm not trying to get more money. I just am not comfortable. You know, I don't know how illegal this is to say something that's not true. I didn't, I didn't have any legal representation at the time. And then they kind of made a little bit, they softened the statement a bit and were like, well, you didn't have an affair, so technically you're not lying. And I was like, oh, oh, you're right, technically. So if I sign this, you'll leave me alone. So I signed it. And then two weeks go by, and they wanted me to sign another one. So you signed the first statement? Yeah. Okay. Did that statement ever come out? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It ran. Okay. Everywhere. Yeah, Got it's it. everywhere. It's everywhere. Um, And then two weeks later, they wanted, the story just was not going away. And they kept, you know, I've pressed at my house. I can't go anywhere. Everything's blowing up. Uh, the company that I work for wanted was pushing me to like do a movie. You know, I was like, no, they wanted to do like a humping Trump. I was like, absolutely not. This is not happening. Um, and then they, I went on the Jimmy Kimmel show and they came to my hotel room. And the, the woman who kind of set it up came to the room with some dresses for me to, that's a PR publicist bring stuff for you to try on. And, you know, wardrobe shoppers or whatever. And she had people with her that, and a guy I didn't know. And they were like, you're going to sign this. And I was like, nope, but I was by myself. I didn't even have an assistant with me in the room and basically said that my life would be very difficult unless I cooperate it. The only way that the story got leaked in the first place is because Michael Cohen shopped a book. And in the treatment for the book, he was like, I am the fixer. And I did this and this and this, including paying off Stormy Daniels $130,000. That's how it got leaked. Oh, so Cohen leaked it himself? Yes. Wow. <laughs> and I'm just like. While he was still Trump's lawyer? Yes. Wow. And, okay. and so now they're asking me to sign this. I said no. And in a panic, I was like, I just need them out of my room because I felt like I was in danger. And I was like, Kimmel will catch this. So yes, I signed it, but no, it's not my signature. I have a very famous signature and I purposely signed it different. And co- uh, and sure enough, Kimmel caught it. That that was my out is I could be like, why is, is there a million Stormy Daniels signatures in the world, but this one doesn't look like the rest. Right. So this story comes out. Uh, and really, the big question is whether this came out of campaign funds. It's and I don't 30, know. 000, right? And Cohen said that he actually paid for you out of his own pocket. Yeah. And I guess he was trying to get Trump to pay him back, but Trump had missed some payments. And this is starting this whole kind yep. of ugly <laughs> sort of situation. Yep. And I'm still quiet. Yeah. <laughs> um. Because I was told I wasn't even allowed to say no comment because no comment is still saying something. Right. And then on March 6th, you actually uh, filed a lawsuit against Trump. Mm-hmm. 
To get out of the NDA. To get out of the NDA. So that I could defend myself because I was getting slaughtered everywhere in the press. And there was uh, another girl, the girl that I told you about earlier that worked, used to work at Wicket before she got fired. Um, she was approaching me and asked, saying, like, you should come forward. Like, you could, you know, she was very anti-Trump being president. She was very, she's more political, I suppose. And I just wanted everybody to shut the fuck up so that I could... <laughs> go on with my life. I was in the middle of directing some mainstream stuff and I, which I lost all of it. Um, and I said, I'm absolutely not doing it. I signed an NDA. I don't want any part of this. Oh, you're sure. I said, I signed an NDA. And then the next thing I know, uh, another girl in the business, Olivia calls me and she's like, stormy, turn on the fucking TV. And I turn it on. And there is that girl telling my story as her own. Because she thought I would never come forward. and But she put her own spin on it. And she's fake crying and holding a press conference. And I was just like, oh, this bitch. <laughs> and um, so she stole my story and tried to pass it off as her own, even though she was never in that room and it didn't happen to her. And she was playing a victim and saying he just a bunch of stuff that she had a lot of the key facts right. But some of the most important ones she was very wrong on. Um, and I got pissed and was like, enough of this. I just have, like, it's just, I'm just, it's just getting worse and worse and worse and worse. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to tell the truth. And so then I tried to find a lawyer. We all know that I ended up accidentally with Michael Avenatti instead of Sean Macias. I don't even pronounce his name, which was the guy that I thought I was going to meet that canceled on me right before. And Michael Avenatti was the only one that was willing to take the case. And he we all know how that turned out. But my point being is that I wanted to be out of the NDA so that I could tell the truth. Yeah. And which I, guess, I which uh, I won. Right. And, and I guess at the time, you didn't really have a lot of money. And he said, hey, I'll, I'll take you on for a hundred bucks. Right. Which he paid for, <laughs> used to pay for dinner. Right. So now you're being represented by Michael Avenatti. Mm-hmm. And his story gets very interesting later on. <laughs> okay. So so this is your lawyer. He's very outspoken. You know, he's always in the media. He's always doing he's interviews. Very charismatic, for sure. Yeah. Uh, so then starts this whole kind of process mm-hmm. of lawsuits and, and Michael Cohen and then Trump and, and all this personal kind of stuff. And then on March 25th of that year, you actually go on 60 Minutes. Well, you and your lawyer, uh, Avenatti, go on 60 Minutes, yep. which is the biggest news show in the world, essentially. Right. And they do their their proper due diligence, you know, like the Wall Street Journal. So now this story is out there and you're telling your side of the story and it's all over the place. Um, are things getting kind of crazier and crazier yeah. as, as this progresses? Of course. And I got offered so much money from so many news outlets and things to, to tell that story. Um, and I purposely chose to do 60 Minutes because they don't pay and they, they were respected news, you know, that it was no way nobody could ever say, oh, they paid me to do it or I did it for the money. Right. I lost out on several hundred thousand dollars. I could have sold that story. I could have broke that story up and sold bits and pieces. I I mean, you know how media works. I could have made a ton of money. I opted to take none, much to the dismay of my agent, by the way. <laughs> um, and, and I'm still not happy with the way that it came out because- they still focus way too much on the, like they, they they grilled me for three and a half hours, and that piece was how many minutes? Sixty minutes. No, it wasn't. There was two other stories. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I'm saying <laughs> so. Twenty minutes. Yeah, well, fifteen minutes actually. Yeah, it was with, like, with a bunch of other interviews. And was that the was that the sixty minutes interview where you said that you you spanked Trump with yep. a, a Forbes magazine? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and that's what they ran instead of yeah. all the other things I've told you. Like, it, it's just it's. It is what it is at this point, I guess. Well, uh, Trump, uh, on April 5th, uh, 2018, he said he didn't know about the $130,000 payment. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, he also said he didn't know why Cohen paid you and so forth. Then on April 19th, the FBI actually raids uh, Cohen's, Cohen's office. office. <laughs> they seize his emails, tax documents, everything else like that. Uh, so, And that is the day that the spark hit the thing and blew up the powder keg because they traced that payment that came <sighs> if you're gonna pay off a stripper use cash <laughs> or like why would you wire the money from the bank account for the shell corp that you're funneling russian money from right. so like i was literally the spark that lit the powder keg 
and you're actually, unintentionally right, and and you're actually cooperating with the feds at this point. Yeah. Well, I, I offered. Yeah. I was like, "Here's the copy of the wire. Here's this. Here's all of this. Just." And then Trump goes on Fox and Friends, and uh, he said, "Yeah, you know, Cohen would rep- represent me on some things." And uh, he represented me on something like this whole Stormy Daniels crazy situation. And that was the first time that he actually admitted. Said my name, yeah. Said your name and connected you and him. Yep. How'd you feel when he actually said your name? I don't know. I, it's, I'm not even going to say vindicate. I mean, it, it was just like, I don't know. Okay. So then Trump gets a new lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. Oh, yeah. And he actually said that Trump actually reimbursed Cohen for the payment. I mean, it just, it's like the whole thing is like a poorly written SNL skit. Right. Like the whole story now changes. Uh, He also said that Trump did know the general arrangement of Cohen's payment, but not the specifics, which actually contradicts what Trump said on April 5th about the whole thing. It's like you can hear the circus music. Uh, then on May, Trump said that uh, you know he tweeted that Cohen entered a, into a non-disclosure agreement with you, and uh, the that Cohen had reimbursed was reimbursed for one hundred thirty thousand through a thirty five thousand dollar retainer, and the money, the money from the campaign or campaign contributions played no role in this transaction. So he's basically trying to separate right. campaign contributions and the one hundred thirty thousand dollar payment to you. Uh. I mean, it just gets messier and messier. And then right after that, you show up on Saturday Night Live mm-hmm. where you played yourself and Alec Baldwin <laughs> played the Trump character. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess on that, you know, on that episode, uh, you know, Alec Baldwin, you know, playing Trump said, I know you don't believe in climate change, but a storm's a coming, baby. Yeah. Now I'm a meme. <laughs> what was it like to be on SNL? That was the most amazing thing ever. Right. Like people were, that's the thing. I should have just off myself immediately after that because it's just not ever going to get any better because SNL is my favorite show. It's the only thing I've ever DVR'd. Don't talk to mommy while she's watching SNL. My dream job was to be a writer for SNL. Like that's what I wanted to do. And not only did I get asked to be on, I got to do the opening monologue. I got to say the the iconic line and it was one of the most star studded cold opens ever i got i met scott johansson i met alec baldwin ben stiller like i mean how fucking amazing it was like a dream and i have no shame in being like it was almost worth the sex with trump like i'm not even gonna lie because i got there and everybody stopped by to see me i met like steve martin was in the audience that night like all these people that are just to me are so amazing and then uh Lauren Michaels was so kind and had me come and sit under the thing with him and his special guests to to watch. And I mean, it's not ever going to get any better than that. <laughs> well, I guess during the course of this, I guess was Trump trying to, well, you were trying to sue Trump for defamation based on the statement. Uh, no, no, made? that was still all the NDA stuff. Okay. I, I can't remember when the defamation thing happened, the exact date. You probably have it in front of you. Well, um, but but Avenatti... Trump put up a mean tweet about me right. saying like that I was a liar and a horse face and whatever. And I immediately fired back with a, with a much better tweet because Twitter is my favorite sport. Um, and I'm way better at it than he is. Uh, and I was done. I was I was done with it. But Avenatti was said that we should sue him for defamation. And I said, we absolutely fucking should not. Um, first of all, I get told mean things a thousand times a day, even before this happened. Like I'm a porn star. It comes with the territory. And he's entitled to his opinion. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I wrote something way worse back at him. So let's just leave it alone. And mine was funnier. So like, I would like to end on this note. And he just kept pushing it. I found out on Twitter that that lawsuit had been filed without my my permission. Uh Um, And then it was pointed out to me, actually, um, a few weeks later by my manager and friends that it actually was defamation. I could it wasn't that he said something mean about me or that he called me a horse face um, which of course I used to twist back. I guess he likes bestiality because he was super into me. Um, I mean, what does that say? You say I look like a horse face, but you tried to fuck me for a year straight. Okay. Um, but that I could say to you, I think you're hideous. I think you are ugly. I think you're a jerk. And 
That's my opinion. I can yeah, say so, whatever so I want. Defamation. But if yeah. I tell you, if I say you're a thief yeah. or you're a liar, that's different. And he said in his tweet that I was lying, that I'd made it up. And I guess that is defamation. Um, that was Avenatti's spin on it. He has a point. I still would have opted not to move forward with that lawsuit. Um, and then he fucked up the paperwork, as we all know. So, Well, uh, Giuliani actually responded to this lawsuit. He said, uh, when speaking about you, he said, the business you were in entitles you to no degree of giving you credibility any weight. Explain yeah. to me how she could be damaged. If you're going to sell your body for money, you just don't have a reputation. A woman who sells her body for sexual exploitation, I don't respect. Exactly. And we can fast forward to this week. And he, apparently that sentiment is shared with everyone everywhere because the whole thing that this has taught me is how terrible people are. Because if I, first of all, going back, all encompassing the whole thing. Um, there was never a time that I didn't see my name anywhere that wasn't prefaced with the word storm, uh, with, the, with the word porn star, which I am. I have, I am, I am very, very proud of my work, but at least ad and director. Come on. <laughs> Um, Stormy Daniels, you, it would not, you, I can't fathom that that article, any news article would have said accountant Stormy Daniel or school teacher or homemaker. Like it's only for the salaciousness of the word porn star. Um, and then it was also immediately followed by my real name. And you don't see that happen to mainstream celebrities. Every time you see Bruno Mars name, is it followed by his real name yeah. or Lady Gaga? No, it's because even the people who intend have the best intentions still inadvertently think of adult actresses or sex workers as less than human. And a couple of them, those hardcore crazy feminists twisted it the other way. Say her name, say her real name. <laughs> and I'm like, didn't even think to ask you what I wanted to be called. You wouldn't misgender me. Like, can you imagine if one of these news articles put the wrong pronoun no but they no one stopped to ask me how i wanted to be identified um so that was a big thing and that i just couldn't possibly be telling the truth because i worked in adult films it just goes to the whole thing oh you can't rape a girl in a short skirt she was asking for it it's really fucking disgusting honestly and i have no credibility i'm sorry i managed millions of dollars for a company for 17 years yeah, it happens to be Wicked Pictures, which happens to be an adult film company. But do you know how much? Do you know how much paperwork I did, and how much money? Like he'll tell you, I I was solely responsible for millions of dollars for this company. I am very credible. Well, around that time, you're still stripping, yeah, right? I never stopped. You never stopped. So you're still, you know, doing feature dancing yes, and so of forth. Course. And this right around that time on July twelfth, two thousand eighteen, you're in Columbus, Ohio. Yep. Dancing at a club. Yep. There was undercover cops yep. in the vicinity. At the stage. On the stage. Because <laughs> I guess the, you know, I guess that the sheriff was a huge Trump supporter. So they yes. set up the sting operation. Mm -hmm. And since they claimed that you touched. Oh, I absolutely officer, touched. I put their face right in my boobs. Right Because they put dollars in my mouth and said, put your tits in my face. Which is something I've done every club that I go to, if it's allowed. I've danced in Columbus, Ohio at least seven or eight times. I know the laws. I'm not technically an employee. I'm allowed to do it. That's one of the things that me and my team do every club that I go to. What are the rules? Is it topless? Is it nude? Do I have to have pasties? Is there a six foot rule? Can I light fireworks out of my butthole? Like every club in every city has a different rule. I've danced in Columbus, Ohio so many times. I know that I have to keep my panties on, but I can put my boobs in your face to take dollars. There's a couple sitting at the stage making out with each other. They're undercover cops making out with each other, putting dollars in each other's mouth. I just went and took the dollar. They stood in line. They got pictures and bought DVDs for me. And then they arrested me. So you get arrested. Yes. And then it comes out that they found the Facebook post between these officers two weeks before I got there bragging about how they were going to arrest me when I got there. There you go. You get arrested. A few hours later, you get out. Mm -hmm. They drop the charges. Mm hmm and then uh, your lawyer, uh, Avenatti, actually sues? No. So I got arrested, which should have also never happened. Even if I broke the law, even if I did do something that was actually illegal, which I didn't, because that's not illegal in there if you're not a, an employee of this, you know, I didn't break the law. Yeah. But let's assume that I had, which I have many times. I'm not going to lie. You know what happens? They write you a $500 ticket. Right. 
No one is hauling in a stripper for touching somebody with their boobs <laughs> in a strip club, consensually strip searching them, taking their diamond earrings, photographing all of my tattoos and putting me in actual jail. That is ludicrous. Um, and that's what happened. They When I said my handcuffs were too tight, he tightened it. I have pictures of all the bru. It was ridiculous. You would have thought I tried to murder somebody. We later find out, of course, that that was a very dirty vice, vice squad. They were responsible for a lot of stuff that happened to other women, um, which you can read about online. It has been, you know, Avenatti was not um, um, licensed, uh, whatever the word is, to practice law in Ohio. So, you got a so I had yeah. local counsel there that were fabulous. And obviously I won my case. And the- Right. Uh, you sued for $2 million and they settled for $450,000? Mm-hmm. Congrats. Thank you. And I guess the five cops that were involved in that uh, were punished as well for yep. their roles in this whole situation. Yep. But obviously this is very politically motivated. Of course. Just another part of the story. So uh, shortly after that, the next month, Cohen actually surrenders himself to the FBI, yep. pleads guilty to eight charges, yep. five counts of tax evasion, one count of making false statements to a financial institution, one count of willfully causing an unlawful corporate contribution, one count of making excessive campaign contribution at the request of a candidate or campaign. And at that point, he pretty much flips on Trump mm-hmm. and goes completely against Trump. What was that like to actually see Cohen flip on Trump? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I remember that. I believe... I was, I think I was when I was in Italy that that happened. And I was just like, just total meltdown. Happy tears, though, this time. Good snot bubbles this time. Right. And then on August 23rd, uh, 2018, uh, Trump goes back on Fox and Friends. And he actually said that he knew, well, he said the funds came from him personally and not from the campaign funds. So at this point now he's admitting of that 130000 is actually coming from him, that he's now officially connected to the whole thing. He said he only knew about the payments uh, later on. Uh, and it contradicts what Cohen said. Uh, you know, Cohen's lawyer actually said that Trump should be prosecuted. See, this is what <laughs> happens so when you lie. You can't keep your story straight. Right. At least I never had that problem because I'm not fucking lying. <laughs> right. And, and then Cohen actually said that he'll rescind and validate the NDA if you return the 130000 to him. Yeah. <laughs> that was going to happen. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, Trump's lawyer said that they weren't we, they wouldn't actually enforce the NDA on September eighth. Mm-hmm. So basically, the NDA is thrown Tossed, out the window, yeah. anyways. Okay. Um, it's like the most fucked up miniseries ever. Right now, around that time, weren't you cast to be on a Celebrity Big Brother? Yes. And you're supposed to be on the show, mm-hmm. and I guess right before the show, they're saying that you refuse to be on. Yes. What happened? Uh, and I feel, thank goodness I recorded all of the Zoom or whatever video calls beforehand because I always had a bad feeling about it, but they just kept off offering more money and whatever. They got up to over over half a million at one point. Um, and I said I wouldn't do anything that would, because ju- I saw these open court cases, obviously. The defamation thing was going, it's just, I didn't want to do anything political. They guaranteed that it wasn't. Um, they promised me there was no surprises. They wouldn't tell me who was the other cast members, which is understandable. That's standard. Mm -hmm. But that it wasn't anybody that was specifically to incite political issues with me. I was like, if it's religious, that's fine. If it's about me doing porn, that's fine. But like while these open cases are going on and my, there's custody stuff going on with my kid because of all this stuff. I was just like, I'm not doing that. They promised me it wasn't. We get there. Um, and then we find out that the set is basically the White House. And the very first challenge was to build a wall for a green card. And I said, I'm not doing that. Um, I'm not making a mock. I, I have an issue with Donald Trump. I have an issue with the president, not the presidency, not the institution of our government, not America. And if I am going to mock those things, I'm definitely not doing it for television in a foreign country. Right. I mean, uh, and and, and I felt fair. like I had been ambushed and I said, I'm not comfortable with this. Um, I also had some, I just gotten served some, uh, papers in regards to custody of my daughter that I wouldn't be able to. And so I was like, I'm not doing it, but mostly it was because they they had lied to me and it was a setup. And I, the, one of the runners on the show, like the PAs or whatever said that there was somebody on the show that was going to be a big problem and that they 
told, you know, basically they lied. And so I quit. Yeah. And, you know, to be fair, you know, just to be accurate, it's not like you were asking for more money or anything. No, like no, yeah. no. Gosh, that no. was established. It wasn't like a shakedown. Or no, anything of that sort. You just no, 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 no. The content. Got it. Yeah. Okay. But then, and I even offered to go on the first episode and make a big thing out of being like, I'm not going to, like, I was trying to negotiate with them. I even said, like, why don't you let me come on? And I see the set and I see the challenge and I lose my shit and have a breakdown. That's good TV. And they, you know, I tried to work with them. Well, uh, you had filed the defamation thing earlier. Mm-hmm. And then on December 11, 2018, the course ordered you to pay essentially $300,000 in attorney's fees mm-hmm. uh, back to Trump. Mm-hmm. Did you ever pay that? Nope. Didn't think so. <laughs> Is that are they still trying to go after that money or no? Do you didn't see the press yesterday? No, I did not. You're late. What happened? Yeah, he just got another 250 because I appealed it, but Avenatti fucked up the paperwork. So I thought this was what this is all about. So he gosh, I guess two weeks ago they finally because we appealed. So I fired Avenatti. Which is a whole thing we're not even going to get into because we're almost out of time. But so he missed, he fucked up the paperwork. Uh, And there was a 10 day gap between the time where he had the cutoff to file an appeal and me hiring my new attorney. Clark Brewster is my attorney. He is absolutely amazing. He's won everything he's done for me and worked on the Ohio thing. He is a brilliant amazing man and i can't say enough thing nice things about him um and his whole team honestly but he, this is not his fault he came in 10 days past what avenatti fucked up um so trump won we went all the way to the supreme court they kicked it back down because at this point um i have to keep fighting because it is defamation and i think that since more things have come out more discovery as in cohen admitting and and all the things you just went through yeah. basically proves without a doubt that Trump did is lying about me being a liar. So if I appeal it, I'm going to win. But ultimately, they, the argument is that he's a public figure. I'm a public figure. And hyperbole, you can say he he, he was joking when he called me that. Hmm. Uh, and so we, we kept fighting it because now there's new information. We thought we'd get a judge that would understand the gravity of the situation that you can't that he sicked his fans on me and like I got shot at twice. My daughter went missing. Like all this fucked up stuff happened to me. I got stopped at the border and they got shot at twice. Twice. I I got stopped at the border going into Canada and they were 17 false charges on my FBI record. Like all these things happened to me that somebody has to be like this poor bitch. Like, hmm. no, he doesn't get away with saying that these things about her that have, he can't call her a liar when these things were proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that she is not lying. Yeah. Um, and so we took it all the way and they kicked it back down to the ninth circuit. Trump won about three weeks ago on a technicality because Michael Avenatti missed the deadline. So he won no matter what. Meanwhile, he, of course, in true tiny fashion, sends out a press release talking about how he won. It was this great victory that it upheld his court ruling of the 200, uh, 300, let's just round up $300,000. But he plays it that the court ruled that I was lying. That is not true. This was not a criminal case. I'm not going to go to jail. He won that he's allowed to tweet. Go fuck yourself. Like it didn't say that I'm, it didn't say that I'm a liar. It didn't say that the the sex didn't happen. It didn't say any of that, but that's how he spun it. So now I'm getting shit on all over again. And then obviously yesterday, literally just yesterday, less than 24 hours ago, I got the message from my attorney that they awarded him an additional 250 from the this appeal. Okay, so that's over half a million that you owe. It's over half a million, but it is not, it is not admitting that he won that I am a liar. Yeah. It one that he is allowed to tweet whatever he wants. And it also proves that our justice system is an ultimate fucking disgrace and a failure because this should never have been allowed to happen. Well, on December 12th, 2018, Cohen was sentenced to three years in prison over this $130,000 payment. So this guy can go to jail and this one gets nothing. Yeah, and actually even, yeah, not only does crazy. he get nothing, now he gets rewarded for his bad behavior. Yeah. Now Trump is all over the internet demanding that I pay him his $500,000 because this dumb motherfucker doesn't even realize it. It's attorney's fees, dipshit. You don't get any of it. You're not an attorney. I don't know if he's just trying to spin it or if he's so stupid that he doesn't even realize what the lawsuit's about. Sorry. No problem. I digress. Okay. 
So then. <laughs> and then. And then 2019 rolls around. And first, your lawyer, Michael Avenatti, was arrested in New York for trying to extort Nike for $25 million. He was not my lawyer anymore. He wasn't your lawyer anymore. Okay. <laughs> well, he gets arrested. Yes. For trying to extort Nike for $25 million. He was facing 40 years in prison. He gets sentenced to 30 months, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then this new <laughs> allegation comes around where he was shopping a book deal for you and he ends up stealing a $300,000 advance? Yes. But we just, he hasn't even been sentenced for that yet. Okay. But I won. I did win. Right. That goes to court. Mm -hmm. You take the stand. Yeah. And then he fires his defense team so that he can exa cross-examine me himself. Or, you know, and that went on for five and a half hours where he basically tried everything possible to discredit me. You know, he tried to, before this even happened, um, he tried, he filed a motion or whatever. There was court documents filed um, saying that I shouldn't be allowed to testify. My evidence shouldn't be submitted because I'm crazy. And so that actually kind of, in my opinion, makes him look worse. So it's okay to steal from a crazy person. Obviously, he has a pattern if you read back to the stuff he did to other people. Um, he subpoenas my mental health records. They do not exist, but he makes a grand show of it so that now the press thinks I'm crazy. But one, I don't have any mental health records. I've never sought treatment. I've never been on medication. He like uh, wanted my pharmacy records. Congratulations. You knew that I was on birth control and had a yeast infection once. <laughs> <laughs> like there's no Ambien, there's no like no no Xanax, no no yeah, no. Yeah. I don't take well, pills. I mean, scare the fuck out of me. I, I don't take I guess, any. I can't even take pain pills. I, I guess my question is, is that you know this is not like a drug deal that he pocketed the money for. Like this is an actual book deal with a major publisher. Yeah, and they sent three hundred thousand to him. It's very traceable. There's an easy paper trail. Of course, the book publisher is going to obviously cooperate because they've already paid the money and they want a book out right. of it. How on earth do you? I don't know. I what don't do know. you think that he his, get away with stealing three hundred thousand dollars for a book deal from you, dude? His own secretary testified and said, "Yeah, he told me to copy and paste her signature. He forged my signature huh. and intercepted the book payment." The text messages that came out in court between Michael Avenatti and my literary agent, because the publisher paid the literary agent who took his commission, and then so there, the publisher is at no fault here. Right. Um, the literary agent Luke Janklau, who I've sued, he has a few more days to respond. The conversations, the text messages between Luke Janklau and Michael Avenatti are fucking repulsive. I don't see how you deal. Like, cause I was blowing up Luke, like, Hey man, you're my agent. Where's my money? Where's my money? Meanwhile, he had already sent it to him. He's like, why isn't she understanding? Avenatti is saying to Luke, I paid her. She gets confused. I get confused over $300,000. Well, right. I mean, if I you lost paid her, then just show the paper trail that you paid her. Very I, easy. I didn't lose $20 in the couch cushions. We're talking right. about $300,000. How do you deal with her? Like, she's a pain in the ass. Like, she's a, like, they're basically fine. Finally, Luke grew a conscience and was like, I can't keep ghosting her. I need to respond to her. But for five months, my own literary agent wouldn't respond to me because he was taking orders from Michael Avenatti because <laughs> I'm a dumb whore. Crazy. So yeah. he gets found guilty. Yes. And he's waiting to be sentenced. Yes. How long do you think he'll get? Not enough. Not enough. What's he facing? 22 years. 22 years. And he's already doing the two and a half years mm -hmm. for the Nike extortion. Yeah. Which is crazy also, yeah. <laughs> that whole story. Okay. And, and here we are in 2022. Uh, quite, a, quite a roller coaster ride over the last few years, I have to say. If Trump walked in the room right now and sat down next to you, what would you tell him? Oh, gosh, that's a great question. Honestly, I think I would just point and laugh. <laughs> I mean. Uh, yeah, well, quite a quite a journey. And honestly, um, you know, shout out to the level of bravery to stand up to a sitting president. You know, it, it's hard to stand up to people of power in general. Uh, but to stand up against someone who's actually the president of the United States and has access to nuclear weapons, and <laughs> the Secret Service and the military and, and all types of, you know, insane supporters because you got shot at twice. Mm -hmm. Did you almost get hit or were they just shooting in the air? No, they shot at the vehicles I was in. They hit the vehicle? The high speed chase. Yeah. Did they ever get caught? 
Really? Mm -hmm. So with all the cameras on the freeway, they couldn't figure out the license plate or, or nothing? Mm -hmm. Really? Florida. Ah, yes. The infamous Florida man. <laughs> <laughs> the Florida man phenomenon, right. The tapes suddenly just got lost somewhere. <laughs> okay. Do you still feel like- I still don't know how the FBI charges got in my record. Yeah. They tried to arrest me at the border. I mean, do you still feel like your life is in danger based on your stance and trying yes. to tell the truth? Yes. And I think it, it got- it got quiet for a while, and I hate to say this, that COVID was one of the best things that ever happened to me because I got to wear a mask. For two years solid, I didn't take a piss by myself. I had two very large armed black dudes with me that I couldn't even pee by myself. And I love my dragons. That's what we, the nickname for the bodyguards. But um, Brandon and Travis were amazing. But at some point, you just want to be able to walk into a hotel room without them going in first. Cover me! With guns everywhere we go, you know? And, um, and just... So that was kind of nice. And then people got distracted. Then he got out of office and everybody was so over it uh, that it was kind of nice. But now it's, it's, I will tell you that the hate and the level of the number and level of hate messages and, and just venom that I've gotten in the last two weeks is equivalent to five years ago. In your personal opinion, over the years, Trump has had so many charges mm -hmm. against him from getting impeached twice, the, the Capitol, you know, the deadly uh, Capitol building attack, the payments to you, the payments here, the payments there, the, the Russia thing and, and everything else like that. At the end of the day, do you think Trump will ever, you know, really get criminally convicted of anything and have to do some jail time? Or do you think ultimately he's just going to slither out of... <laughs> everything he's been doing, you know, like, um, guys be, like the way that he's been pulling it off this whole time. If you'd asked me that question two weeks ago, I'd have said he's going to go down. Like, I have faith. I have faith in karma. I have faith in whatever higher power or I, I have faith in the justice system. I just have faith. Um, too much evidence, too many things. But this last week, I honestly don't know. Um, I don't know. I... I have a feeling, and this is not a threat, <laughs> uh, but I have a feeling he will he will end up no longer living in some form before something like that happens. It's just a feeling I have. Oh, you think he might off himself if he uh, has to go to prison? I don't think so. I, I just have a feeling that something's, something's going to happen. Yeah? Do you think he's going to run for president again? I think he thinks he is. I guess it depends on how how soon before his arteries clog up and he dies on the toilet. Dear Santa. Gotcha. Well, Stormy Daniels, appreciate you coming in. I feel like you have a very historic story. Regardless it's of something. whether people like you, don't like you, agree with what, you know, or disagree, you've gone down in history. Uh, you actually went after a sitting president uh, through no fault of your own, honestly. You were just minding your business. Yeah, you just know? trying to. You, you know, whatever happened, whatever happened, you know, they're the ones that approached you. For the hush money. But uh, I do remember that moment where I could have just said, let her run with that story. I'm just not going to say anything. And it would have died away, you know. But I just couldn't. Yeah. I'm a fucking idiot. Appreciate you coming in and sharing. Uh, you know, I think people are going to watch this for years to come. And I think it really sets kind of a blueprint for, you know, how women deal with powerful men and, you know, sort of the implications of it. You know, they may think, oh, you know, this person's going to promise me this and so forth. And he's really going to tell the truth. And oftentimes it's not the truth. Right. And, you know, NDAs, money, everything else like that. Although it seems official and it seems like it's ironclad, especially coming from someone of that stature. A lot of times it, it just doesn't matter. No. It just doesn't matter. And, you know, I hope that things work out for you legally. At the end of the day, even if Trump's Trump wins this half a million dollar judgment, good luck trying to get it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So appreciate you coming in. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Peace.